It's been a powerful evening already. What God is doing and what he continues to do in our lives. Um, today, I think many of you are aware that uh, one of our board members, Ted Travis, has uh, been diagnosed with uh, a form of leukemia. He has gone through intensive uh, chemotherapy and um, is going to be having a bone marrow transplant in about five weeks. I wonder if uh, Ted and Shelly would just come up for a moment. Uh, is Shelly, where's Shelly? There's Shelly, they weren't even sitting together, but uh, I don't think they're mad at each other today. <laughs> and while they're coming, if, if I want John, and then I would like every pastor that's here to come, we're gonna lay hands on Ted and Shelly to begin with tonight. And uh, why don't you come right here, Ted and Shelly, and, and then all the pastors, John, and then all the... <laughs> Sorry about that. If all the pastors would come and uh, Ted and Shelly will be standing here, we'll all just lay hands on them. And Harvey Drake, who is uh, one of our board members and a pastor, that'd be great, you want to sit down? Harvey Drake, who is one of our board members and pastor of a church in Seattle, is going to lead us in prayer. And I'd like the rest of you who are, as the pastors make their way up here, the pastors of the CCDA network, we want to lay hands on Shelly and Ted. And we want to pray for Ted's healing. We want to pray for Shelly's comfort, strength. We want to pray for their children, Weston, Heather, and Scotty. And the rest of you that are in the room, if you would stand and just join in this celebration of prayer. And Harvey will lead us now. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy. Yes. In your name I pray. You are our Father. Yes. Father, you are our Father. Yes, Jesus. Send your word to heal them to this thing. Send your word to the Lord God. The release of your power. Yes. Yes. Yes, Jesus. Cancer, I pray, oh God. Yes. yes. Let the power of your healing yes, Lord come Jesus. to that situation. In the name of Jesus. Yes. Yes. Curse that yes, cancer, I pray, oh God. Thank you, God. In the name of Jesus. Yes. Let yes. the kingdom come. Yes. Be done. Let the kingdom come. your ruling hand, I pray. Yes, Jesus. Come in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the blood of Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. Yes. God, we give you the glory. Yes. 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 Thank you, Lord. Increase her faith, I pray, Lord. Give her more of your strength. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Lord.
your magnificent name, Lord. Thank you. Let's remember and let's remember Shelly and the children. Amen? Amen. Every day when we go into prayer, let's remember them. Let's pray to God on their behalf. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We as the board laid hands on Ted and prayed for him. And we have been praying for him for the last several weeks since he was diagnosed and for Shelley. I would encourage you to continue on a daily basis to pray for Ted, Shelley, Weston, Heather, and Scotty in their journey and, and their walk. Lord, may the meditations of my heart, the words of my mouth, be acceptable tonight to you, my Lord, my rock, and my strength. Amen. Almost 30 years ago, when I was 16 years old, I said to God, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. It was at that time that I sensed God leading me and heard the voice of God, not audibly, but the voice of God in my heart, in my mind, that said, I want you to work among African American people as a white man in our country. Since that time, I have done my best to be obedient to what I heard God's answer to my question in telling God, I'll do anything you want me to do. It was at all over this country, I've talked in college campuses and churches and rarely has there been a time that I haven't encouraged people to just pray that simple prayer of what it means to be a child of the King. A child that says to our God and our Father, God, I'll do anything that you want me to do. And I've encouraged people to simply say that to our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ and allow God then to guide and to move. And I think most of you in this room have said that to God and God has worked in your heart and you've been obedient and you've done it. I have continued to try to say that to God every day of my life for the last 30 years. This was put to the test in a new way. It began about a year ago, where I began to realize and it began to slowly become apparent to me that if I was going to be obedient to God, if I was going to love my family, I needed to move out of Lawndale for a period of time. As I searched my heart, this gut-wrenching decision went against everything I have stood for. My philosophy of ministry, my passion to do Christian community development, to do incarnational ministry, and to live in Lawndale. Some of you have honored me and 
humbled me by reading Real Hope in Chicago. And you will notice if you read the book or look in the book that the first five words of Real Hope in Chicago are very simple. I love living in Lawndale. Then I tell a bunch of stories of what God has done. And then I close the book in case you didn't understand with the same five words. I love living in Lawndale. For 23 years, it's been my home. After my honeymoon with my fantastic wife, Ann, we came to set up shop in North Lawndale. My children, Angela, Andrew, and Austin were all born and brought home to our little apartment in Lawndale. For more than half of my life, Lawndale has been my home. On your chairs tonight was a statement. I'm not that good of a writer, but this was one that I worked very diligently on. And it was a statement that I wrote, not for necessarily public distribution, <laughs> but to my personal friends and my leaders at Lawndale Community Church. I am not going to read this tonight, but I would encourage you to read it if you so desire. But I wanted you to have that because sometimes we can put our thoughts down in writing a little bit better. But tonight what I'd like to do in a timely fashion is to give you a time capsule of the hardest year of my life. Tonight I want to share with you part of my journey through this move out of Lawndale. About a year ago, a couple things happened that seemed to set this decision in motion. The first being my oldest son Andrew entered high school, a Chicago public high school, where of course white people are the minority. And for some reason, even though he thought and I thought and everyone else thought that this was the school for Andrew, it wasn't a fit. He seemed to be feeling overwhelmed with the things that were going on at the school. He loves athletics. Andrew, you know, is the deep thinker of my family challenged me beyond my, any challenge of any other human being, probably my son Andrew. He's the one when Magic got, Johnson got AIDS and I had the opportunity of the teachable moment to talk to Andrew about sex and sex outside of marriage, that he looked me when I was right there at Buckingham Fountain, Grant Park, downtown Chicago, Andrew stopped dead in our tracks and looked me in the eye and he said, Dad, did you have sex with anybody besides Mom before you got married? <laughs> That's my Andrew. <laughs> and you probably should answer your son honestly when he asks you that question. And I did. I think Andrew probably thought he was very discouraged about football at Whitney Young High School. There was a janitor who was not a teacher who was the coach. Chicago public schools don't do things the way all the schools do around <laughs> Chicago. And he was very discouraged. And I think he probably thought if you would ask Andrew that I was more committed to Lawndale than I was to him. Secondly, my co-pastor, Carrie Casey, who many of you have met and has been at our CCDA conference and gave a fantastic talk last year, one of my best friends in the whole world, after gut-wrenching decisions on his part and his family, accepted a call of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes to go to Kansas City to be the senior vice president 
YMCA and to move from Lawndale. These two things happening at the same time seem to set some things in motion for a family. Andrew, even though he was somewhat angry with me, kind of in a crazy kind of way, began to come after football, after two or three days of practice, and begged me, literally begged me, to come and coach his team at his high school. I prayed about it. I talked to the other coaches, and the head football coach had already offered me, because I am an old football coach. If I wanted to help out in any way, he would love to have me. And after two days of praying and thinking, decided that I would do that. And so I then began to coach football. I went to practice every day. I was there, and I, even though I did not get paid, I treated it that it was the most important responsibility. It proved to be an extremely rewarding experience. Many of you last year remember that I was to give an address on Saturday night. The plans of a CCDA conference are weeks and months in advance, and our football team happened to have a game that night, that afternoon. And so Saturday morning, I got up, and I had it all worked out, and I flew back to Chicago Saturday morning, got the L, took the L to home, and then went to the football game, coached the game. At the end of about three and a half quarters, it was in a snowstorm in Chicago. There were three inches of snow. We played on AstroTurf, and it was a difficult time. But Andrew scored his second touchdown of the day, and we went ahead 20 to nothing, and there's about seven or eight minutes left in the fourth quarter. We had the game well in hand, and Dr. Art Jones had come to the game to support us, one of my best friends in Chicago. And Art was there ready with his car to zip me to the airport as fast as he could so that I could catch my airplane and then I could come back and speak at the CCDA conference. I said to Andrew after he scored that touchdown to put us ahead 20 to nothing as we began to kick the field goal and he came off the field for that play. I said, Andrew, he came off and he looked. I said, Andrew, I've got to go. I've got, I've got to get back to Birmingham. Andrew said to me, he said, Dad, thanks for coming back for the game. And I said, Andrew, you're welcome. He said, Dad, I love you. I said, Andrew, I love you. And with tears in my eyes and his eyes, we embraced. And I walked off the field, zipped to the airport, only to find that the airplane was grounded because of the snowstorm. <laughs> I didn't make it back, but Andrew understood. In spite of Andrew's discouragements, he did amazingly well at Whitney Young. In football, his team ended up going 13-0 and and winning the city championship, and he scored 34 touchdowns that year. In basketball, he had experiences that anybody would just hope that they could have. He ended up playing with six Division I scholarship athletes. The varsity of Whitney Young won the city championship for the second year in a row and won the state championship basketball tournament in the state of Illinois, of which he got a chance to practice with every day. And being a pretty good basketball player, Andrew then also as a freshman, was asked to come and not play on the freshman team, but to be on the sophomore team. And he was sixth man on a sophomore team that placed second in the city. And he got tremendous playing time and did well the whole year. It was a unique experience as at Whitney Young, he broke the color barrier on the basketball team. <laughs> White men maybe can't jump, but they can do a few other things on the basketball court. <laughs> but in 34 basketball games that Andrew played in in the city of Chicago, it was quite interesting that there was never another white person on the court in all 35 games. He broke the color barrier every time he played in the city of Chicago. And Andrew's grades were doing quite well, and things were doing pretty fine. But it just continued to see that, seem that it just wasn't a match. 
were struggling with this, Ann and I had dinner with the best man of my wedding and his wife, Peggy. And we were sharing a little bit, and Peggy looked me in the eye. We were talking a little bit about some of our struggles and how it was a little hard for us right now. But we'd weathered many storms many times in very difficult situations in the 23 years we've lived in Lawndale. But she looked at me, and I'll never forget, Peggy looked me in the eye, and she's a very forceful person. She looked at me and she said, Gordy, the decision is simple. You need to move out of Lawndale. You need to humble yourself and do it. Well, the conversation kind of ended right there. <laughs> because, of course, I was not interested in hearing that. <laughs> the next day I went out, it was a Saturday, I went out in my backyard. It's not a very big backyard in Lawndale, but it's a little bit. And I sat there and it was cold and I had a coat on. <coughs> it was a cold early winter morning. And as I sat there, I began to pray. I said, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. And as I sat there in my backyard that night, I recognized, and I began to come with grips to the point that I think God wanted me to move out of Lawndale. I didn't exactly understand why. Things seemed to be going better. But as I heard the Lord, as I sat there and cried and wept, the Lord said, yes. My grieving began then. I believed at that time that if I moved, I must leave my call to ministry. Because everything in me says, as we believe in CCDA of relocation, that you must live in the neighborhood. I've said that everywhere I've gone. And so for me, it was a very difficult obedience because I felt I was honoring God at the same time I had to dishonor God in how to make that decision. I began to seek counsel, as all of us need to do. And everybody I sought counsel from are people in CCDA because you're the people that I respect. Ann and I spent countless hours over the course of a few years even in our friendship with Bob and Peggy Lupton. And Bob and Peggy have been there and through this hard time they were there for us to support us and to help process this, give us somebody to talk to. Ray Bakke was there for me as Ray was from the very beginning as my first mentor of urban ministry 30 years ago. And Ray began to give me some hopes and he began to dream some options of what my life might look like. In fact, Ray had my life planned out then, moved from Lawndale, and he's got the next 20 years planned out. <laughs> Brian understands that. And of course then I talked, and Ann and I talked with John and Vera Mae Perkins, and in talking to John and Vera Mae we began to realize that again John and Vera Mae began to help us dream new opportunities. And then one day I had lunch before I made a decision totally. Even though I was leaning away, I had lunch at Lou Melnati's, of course, with Glenn Carine. And as Glenn and I sat there for that three hours of lunch, and when everybody else was gone but in the restaurant, but it was only Glenn and I, Glenn was weeping and crying about situations in his life, and I was weeping and crying about situations in my life. And as we wept and as we cried together, Glenn said to me and met my need, and he said, whatever you do, don't leave your call. Walk through this. And then he said to me in a profound manner, let the people of Lawndale love you. Anne said to me, as the wonderful wife that she has been to me for these 21 years of marriage, she said, this is your decision. Whatever you believe we should do, I'll do that. I think Anne recognized first that it would probably be best if we moved for our lives and our situation at the time. But she was not going to force my hand and she was not going to force me to do something that went against who I am. I encourage you to find people in CCDA who understand you to talk to. At the same time, I was preaching through 1 John. 
And in preaching through 1 John, I was preparing messages weeks ahead of time, as most of us do as we look ahead and kind of see where we're going. And I found the last verse that, we, that didn't make sense in the book of 1 John. It, it still makes absolutely no sense. Most of the book is about love and all these great things and about how Christ died for us. You know the book of 1 John. If you look at it, there's one verse that just is kind of crazy. It's the last verse, chapter 5, verse 21, where John says, flee from idolatry. I said to myself in my study, what in the world is God talking about? What does John write this for? It makes absolutely no sense. It doesn't go with anything else in the book. And so I then asked the question, God, do I have any idols in my life? Thinking, of course, that God would say to me, nah, you're a good guy. I mean, you're a great guy. He had been talking to Noel. But God knows, as Don Davis said, and as Larry said last night, God knows Wayne Gordon's heart. And I suppose somewhat because of my brokenness through this decision and striving to make it, God said that my idol was living in the community, relocation, and that that was a higher priority than even loving God. In my brokenness, God spoke to my heart. And then it thought, what, the thought came over me, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? but forfeits his soul. My family, my soul. But it was at Spencer's, Spencer Perkins' funeral that God crystallized my decision. At the end of January, it's a very difficult time for us and we're gonna talk about that tomorrow. But it was there that I knew that God was not going to take no for an answer from me and that it was time to move and that God was formulating the plans of John Perkins that it was time for John and I to spend more time together to model out a black man and a white man in a friendship building CCDA traveling together and walking the decision was made I was going to move from Lawndale now, the implementation of this decision. I want to quickly tell you a couple things. The first, the thing that I dreaded the most, I, I think Ann and I together, we just dreaded this. But those of you that know Lawndale, you know that Ann and I have had partners in ministry from almost the very beginning. I lived in Lawndale about three or four years by myself, two years before I got married, and then about three or four years before some ministry partners moved in, Art and Linda Jones. Art is the, executive, or the president of our health center and our first doctor. And Art and Linda and Ann and I have co-owned a building in Lawndale for 18 years, and we live in the same apartment building. How could we tell Linda and Art? We made several plans to, t call, to tell them and ask them to get together with us. And one night I remember, it was a Monday night, and I, we were going to talk as soon as I got home from Kingdom Men, and I called Ann and I said, I, I, I was literally sick to the point of vomiting. I said, I can't meet with them tonight. It was so painful. But a few days later, we did meet, and we began to tell them what we were thinking. And of course, we felt terrible, and we shared, and we cried. Art and Linda's response was the response that I'm sure most of you would expect from them. Their response was of grace, of love, of understanding, and of support. And they said, we support you, and we will back you in whatever you do. The second thing was, the first day, we went to look at a house. The word suburb is not a part of my vocabulary. <laughs> and the word suburb is actually a swear word to me. <laughs> you know how I say I love Lawndale? Well, I hate the suburbs. The first day that Ann and I were out looking at houses, we stopped and I, again, we sat down to try to get a bite to eat. I couldn't eat. My head was just banging. My gut was 
about to explode. My back was so sore, I couldn't even sit down. It was a painful thing. I was literally physically sick. But we found a house a few days later and decided that we would buy. The day we signed the contract, it was a Saturday. I'll never forget this day. Our daughter Angela was with us, who's a freshman in college now. And Angela and Ann and I had come in separate cars, and so we're there, and, and we go to the realtor's place, and we're going to sign this contract, and so we're, we're there, and we're signing it, and as I'm sitting there signing this contract, uncontrollably, I begin to weep. And tears begin to come down my cheeks. And the realtor comes in, and she first walks in the room, and she says, Oh, congratulations, we're so pr glad that you got a house. And then she looks me with this dumbfounded look that, you know, I didn't seem to be crying for joy. And she just kind of was quiet. I signed. I said, Honey, you do the rest. Angela's there comforting me, patting me on the back, and saying, Dad, I love you. It's going to be okay. <laughs> I get in the car and I drive and of course it, I go straight to Midway Airport because I'm picking up John Perkins as John is flying in that day to spend time with us. The next difficult hurdle was telling my close friends on staff. <coughs> Richard Townsell, I call him Doc. This is his nickname as a kid. But of course he's not a kid anymore. But after I wept and I cried more in this year than I've ever cried at putting all my years of life together. And I remember Doc, after I said and told them a little bit of what was on my heart, he looked straight at me before I could hardly get everything out. He says, Coach, you don't have to prove a thing. You don't have to do anything. We know your heart. We, you have our full support. Then I went before the deacons and the outreach council. You read the statement. I offered to resign as the pastor. For two weeks, our church was in turmoil. People were worried about what was going to happen, but it was the decisions of the deacons and the outreach council. I went to them, and I remember Pat Herod, who's here. She said, Coach, we're not going to make this decision. You have to make it. What are you going to do? I said, no, I'm moving. Now, what you've got to decide is, am I supposed to stay and be a pastor here? My resignation is on the table. But it's, I will stay if you want me to, but I will not if you think it's best that I don't. They worked at it. It wasn't a flippant decision. They agonized, they prayed, and for two weeks we met. When we came back together for the meeting, after two weeks of praying and fasting and thinking, two things happened. One is the chairman of the deacon board, Lance Green, who happens to be here at the CCDA conference, Lance says... He immediately starts the meeting as we're having the discussion, and I'm in the room, and he says, it would be a travesty, it would be a tragedy if we turned our back on Coach tonight and did not have him stay and did not extend him grace to continue to pastor at Lawndale Community Church during these three years that he is going to be away. Then Stacy, the chairperson of our outreach council that over, over, also oversees me, says, speaks up. And she says, she re, kind of refers to this remote passage in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30 about when David and his men were away and the army was there and they, and they, they, they came and they, they, they stole all their children and their wives and took them away and they, she come, they, David gets back and they're all gone. And they're in pain and they're suffering. And she said, you know what? We can't turn our back on Coach, on what's going on right now. What we need is to support him. And then she turned to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27. that says, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. And Stacy and everyone in that room, eyes were wet. We were all crying. And she said, we need to support Coach and Ann. They've supported us all these years. The people of Lawndale began to love me in ways that they never had before because they, I wouldn't let them. The deacon and the outreach council made the decision that's at the bottom of that. It's a three-year plan for me to continue pastoring even though I don't live in Lawndale. It violates all of our ministry and the philosophy of ministry of Lawndale. We just hired a, another pastor to come and join us on our pastoral team. And we required 
this person to move to Lawndale. <laughs> Our ministry philosophy has not changed. Then the move. Oh, the CCDA board. Again, the same thing was true with the CCDA board. They were with me in January when we prayed and talked, and then again when we came together. And the CCDA board, I offered my resignation. How can the president of CCDA not live in the community? How can the president of CCDA not be relocated into the inner city? It was something I didn't think was possible as the president myself. If, I, if it was someone else, I would be calling for that person's resignation. How humbling it was when the CCDA board asked me to leave the room and I left and they made some discussion and when they brought me back, they said that it was a unanimous decision that we want you to stay on as president during this time and we support you in what you're doing. The love of people, the grace, the move. Well, with a borrowed truck, and the Hope House men, Stanley and the Hope House men, we made three trips from Lawndale to Naperville and back. Each trip was a couple hours long besides the loading and unloading. The last trip out of Lawndale was we drove out of Lawndale with tr tears streaming down my cheeks. It was only fitting that my only comforter was a recovering drug addict in Hope House named Darnell. And he said, Coach, are you okay? Can you drive? Can you see the road? <laughs> Do you want me to drive? Of course, he doesn't have a driver's license, so the options weren't all that great. But we moved. After the move, yes, it's been hard. It has been very hard. It has been the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. There's no doubt about it. We all miss living in Lawndale. Three weeks ago, Austin was asked the question, how do you like your new school? Unbeknownst to me or anyone else, Austin, who's a ten, our 10-year-old, looked the person straight in the eye and says, I hate it. <laughs> he likes his old school in the city, the public school that he went to, better than his other. Austin misses Kaboomers, the track team that Lance has at our church that he ran on every day. He misses that. Angela away at college, every time she comes home, she wants to, of course, go to the city. She wants to be sure that she can be there on a Sunday so she can go to Lawndale Community Church on Sunday. Andrew, a couple weeks ago, was invited to go to homecoming by a young little lady at Whitney Young High School. And so he went back to the homecoming dance at his old high school in the city and had a great time with all of his old friends who continue to be his friends in the city. And then two weeks ago, I don't think he might was serious, but I'm not quite sure. He said in front of Ann and I, he said, Dad, I think, I, got, I think what we ought to do is you and I need to let Mom and Austin live out here, but you and I need to get an apartment and move back to the city. <laughs> we all miss the city. And we miss living in the city. Angela said that a woman came up to her one of these crazy women, you know, one of these women that think that living in the suburbs is what it's all about. <laughs> and she says to Angela, she says, oh, I'm so thankful, I'm so glad that you finally live in the suburbs and you finally, you kids can have your life and you can do that. You know, Angela just thought, what is this person talking about? And she came home and relayed the story to Ann and I and she said, this lady was clueless in understanding who we are and what we stand for. We all miss the city. But with the move, there have been some new opportunities. Let me briefly say a couple. First of all, Lawndale. In God's providence, I know I've made the right decision. Anybody can judge me. Anybody can say that I may have made the wrong. I'm okay with that. I really am. And, I, and, I, and I'm not here to justify. I'm only here to tell you about it. But I'll tell you one thing God did. One thing God has done is it's, he said, Coach, you are a meddler. Coach, you got your hand in everything in Lawndale. And you are stifling the people that are there. You see, the days that you don't come in, and I'm never there on Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays, it's an amazing thing. Lawndale does not fall apart. In fact, it thrives on those days. It's the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday that it's stifled. And it's amazing how people have risen. We now have a pastoral team, not of one big shot, but it's not one. We have no senior pastor at Lawndale Community Church. We have a pastoral team of seven people 
The six others happen to be African Americans, and all seven of us work together. And one of them, in an amazing kind of way, is Carrie Casey, who's our pastor at large living in Kansas City. I mean, God does amazing things once we are obedient. And then people like Chelsea and Willette and Carrie and Jojo and Robert and Donna and Stacy and Lance and Reba and Stanley and Phil and Sharice and Precious and Doc and Pat and I can continue going, but those are all people I've stifled. And I chose their names carefully tonight. That now they're rising to new sites and horizons because they have to do things without even asking my opinion before they do it. CCDA has given me a new opportunity to travel and represent you. I have been a very lame duck, do-nothing president of CCDA. You all know that. Bob Lupton told me that's all we needed in the president, is a do-nothing president. <laughs> and so I have taken him at his word and been that for the last 10 years. I hope I don't mess up CCDA because now I'm doing a few things. But the opportunities are there for things to happen. I'm also working at Eastern Seminary and got a chance to teach a course on the church and community development. I'm teaching a course with Ron Sider on faith-based solutions for urban problems. And I've had a chance to show my family that I love them more than I love ministry. Three years from now... Three years from now... We'll be moving back to Lawndale unless God leads us someplace else. God, I'll do anything you want me to do.